Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Not too long ago, I covered the return of Big Eyes Small Mouth, a premiere entry in anime role-playing. With how well that's been doing for itself of late, I predicted offhandedly that it was only a matter of time before Diskami would dip into the D20 system again. Well, fast forward a year later, and what do I happen to see while browsing the recommended tab on Kickstarter? Well, I sure hope somebody picks up that phone. Do what? Because I f***ing called it! Well, I'd like to say that, but truth be told, even a blind man could have seen this coming. What I did not see coming is how well it ended up doing. As the title indicates, Anime 5e is Diskami's take on bringing their own BESM 4th edition and D&D 5th edition together. But that does force me to address the elephant in the room. That being the last time that was tried known as Besom D20. Released during the early days of the D20 bubble, it was an attempt to combine aspects of the D20 system with Besom's second edition, as this was a few years before third would come out. While I personally found it to be kind of clunky in the way that a lot of first wave of third party OGL properties were, there were some that treated it as their gateway into role playing. This is why I haven't softened on it, since while it had problems, a lot of those problems are due to the quirks of mixing a crunch heavy game like 3. E-D&D, &D, with a lighter game like Besom. There was also, as McKinnon admitted in my interview with him, the fact that they tried to go for a kitchen sink approach, trying to encompass all kinds of genres, which didn't help matters. Fortunately, D&D 5th Edition is significantly less crunch-intensive, and instead of trying to encompass every genre, it's aiming just for fantasy gaming. A much smaller net, to be sure. Beyond that, Anime 5e has stated four goals with its opening chapter. To provide effect-based rules for 5e, offer point-based character options, explore rule alternatives, and to be anime fantasy instead of just fantasy. The lattermost part is an interesting focus, but for that I'd like to turn it over to my good brother Shades for his insight in the matter. Hello again, folks. So we need to separate what is fantasy anime from other forms of fantasy. Since we're mainly looking at high fantasy here, you'd think I'm gonna mainly use the Tolkien standard, the obvious stuff, to see what anime do differently. Both have stuff like kings, queens, dragons, dwarves, horses, fortresses, magic, and swords. Shout out to Epic Rap Battles for history for that one. It's just that anime fantasy adds a bit of its own over-the-top influence into it. But while many fantasy anime do have those elements to them, what makes them stand out is the fact that they don't always adhere so strictly to the Tolkien formula. Some do, like Slayers and Record of Lotus War, both of which were based on their creator's D&D games. But a lot of fantasy anime draw from other influences. The Maji franchise takes influences from a lot of Middle Eastern culture, mainly the stories of Alibaba and Sinbad. Inuyasha takes place in a fantastical version of the Sengoku period. Even in more modern settings, the Fate franchise draws from all kinds of myths and legends for its story. And that's not even getting into the Isekai genre, where the fantasy settings have outright exploded. Shows like Re Zero, That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime, Konosuba, and Rising of the Shield Hero, among others, all have a fantasy setting, with the only twist being someone from modern times has been thrown into it. Then look at what most of us consider to be fantasy media here. A large portion of them either follow the Tolkien formula outright, or are heavily inspired by it. If not, they lean more towards a Conan the Barbarian approach. The Dark Crystal, the Beastmaster, Willow, Dragon Slayer, Fire and Ice. Also, notice that the most popular films of the genre all came out in the 1980s. 80s. Aside from the Lord of the Rings franchise itself, not many fantasy movies have really taken off all that much. Hell, the only modern franchise that is considered fantasy that's still well known is the Harry Potter franchise. But it's been more of an exception, not the rule around here. It's not as strong a genre in the West, at least in terms of viewership, though studios have sure as hell tried. But in Japan, fantasy is stronger than it's ever been. So it only makes sense to make a TRPG that really taps into that potential. Which brings us to this little game that the monk's about to take a look at. All yours, my friend. But the burning question is, of course, how well does it hold up? Let's find that out for ourselves, shall we? At 274 pages, Anime 5e trades Besom's pink and purple for red and white. A lot of the presentation patterns from its big brother are still present here, along with some reused artwork, but I kind of expect that at this point. That said, I'd argue that Anime 5e is even more noob-friendly in its writing, with its use of sidebars that explore alternative ideas. It's clear that Anime 5e is meant to be as standalone as possible, Remember this for later. And of course, there's the all-important index. Good stuff all around. 
Character creation is a mixture of freeform and level centric. And we'll be exploring that with our mascot winter mage known as Aldine Zavok Robinson. I'll also note that anytime I'm covering a more universal lining game, Alden or Aldine will be used. The first thing to do is to establish our starting level. This is tied into the tier of adventurer, as well as our starting discretionary points. Aldine is a fairly seasoned adventurous, so we'll be going with 12th level. That means we have a total of 91 discretionary points. Second is ability scores, which is our first expenditure of discretionary points. We can roll these the old-fashioned way, but we won't for reasons I'll get into later. Anyways, our starting spread is Strength 8, Dexterity 10, Constitution 14, Intelligence 12, Wisdom 13, and Charisma 15. Second is Race, which is a collection of attributes and defects that'll be our second use of discretionary points. There's some familiar faces to D&D veterans, but the non-standard races are the ones here that get full write-ups and descriptions. These include ones like Necogenes, Blink Beasts, Half Trolls, and Demonaga that have details on their racial attributes and defects, as well as how to handle sub-races. Now we'll be going with a Silver Half Dragon, which costs us 13 discretionary points. As a result, we gain a plus one modifier to Strength and Constitution, a rank in Flight, three ranks in Cold Immunity, one rank in Language, so that we can learn Draconic, and four ranks in our Cold Breath weapon. Third is Class, which does not use discretionary points and levels as you would in Vanilla 5e. I should note that feats are not present here, as given the way Anime 5e is set up, there wouldn't be much point. We'll be going with the Bender class at 12th level. This grants us a D8 hit die, rank 6 in a lesser dynamic power, in our case we'll be using Ice, rank 2 in Immutable, rank 3 in Energized, and rank 2 in Edge for our dynamic power attacks, meaning we roll those with advantage. Lastly, we'll spend the rest of our discretionary points on attributes and defects. We'll start out with defects. In our case, we'll go with rank 3 in Obligated, rank 1 in Ism, rank 2 in Magnet, and rank 2 in Vulnerability to Fire. These grant us an additional 14 discretionary points. Then we'll spend our discretionary points on the following. Rank 1 in Control Environment, Rank 2 in AC Bonus, Rank 2 in Combat Mastery, Rank 7 in Combat Technique, Rank 5 in Wealth, and Rank 4 in Connected. I may have borked the math a little, but overall the system is about what I'd expect. In fact, I'd say it's better than last time since there are less moving parts to deal with. That said, the one part of it that's a head-scratcher to me is Ability Scores. Given that you spend discretionary points as these as well, I don't understand why rolling for them was presented. It's like an attempt at a middle ground between point buy and attribute expenditure, and I just don't get it. I get the idea that higher ability scores equates to a smaller budget for attributes before putting in defects. I'm just not 100% on the method. I honestly would prefer less discretionary points in exchange for being able to do the traditional roll your stat setup. I re or if you need to have the discretionary points as it is, just skip the rolling for stats as a whole. I mean, Fantasy Craft does it and it works. Oh well. Now of course, there's also the other ish issue, that is Analysis Paralysis, which even with a wide net that this game is going to cast, that was always going to be inevitable. I hope to see some template PDFs in the future regarding this. Now, pregens don't count. Overall, it's a net positive in character creation, but as with most point by systems, the GM is going to have to be more hands-on. That said, the relationship Anime 5e has with classes is an interesting one. So let's dig into that. Class design in Anime 5e is a mix of proficiencies, hit dice, attribute ranks, and bonus points. The attributes essentially act as class features for the character. This does result in significantly simpler class designs and an easier form of multi-classing compared to D&D 5e proper. However, it is going to make class conversion a bit tricky, which we'll get to in a moment. In all, Anime 5e introduces 14 new classes. Adventurer, Bender, Broker, Dynamic Spellbinder, Hunter, Isekai Student, Magical Girl Slash Guy, Ninja, Pet Monster Trainer, Psionicist, Shadow Warrior, 
Tech Knight, and Warder. The majority of these classes are only two pages in length apiece, and the only one that really uses the Vancean model for spell effects is the Psionicist, although the Dynamic Spellbinder can be reworked into using it. At the back end of this entry, the core book delves into the class entries from Vanilla 5th edition. In particular, how class design for Anime 5e de demands a degree of balance that D&D isn't necessarily interested in. Well, it used to be, but I'll bring that edition up the next time I feel like getting pitchforks outside my house again. Overall, I think that the class design here is far more structured than it is in 5e, and thus I feel would be easier to hack. It's for that reason that I would be very interested in seeing people's multi-class combinations, as well as custom classes, which I've already seen a few on the Discami Discord, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be seeing more as the months go on. I didn't cover the mechanics in this review, largely because it's still D&D 5th Edition's version of the D20 system. It largely would have been redundant beyond the minutiae entries that, if I went down that route, I'd be going back into old habits doing a let's read. However, there once again is an elephant sitting on my couch that I need to address. I really need to deal with this elephant problem. If you are looking for an anime spin on the self-proclaimed world's greatest role-playing game, oh, this ain't it. And it's not intending to be. Anime 5e has far more in common with Fusion, in the sense that it's a combination of elements between D20 and Tristat. Now again, both have far less moving parts than the last time this was tried, making for a far more approachable affair that has a lot of potential on its own, and even more potential for customization. It is for that reason that I give Anime 5e a stamp of strongly recommended. While it could use some minor quality of life improvements to make creation a little less daunting, and I think those are being worked on, I do think that this is an ideal sandbox for those who want to take D&D and crack it open in a new way. I am largely giving it this recommendation because of the sandbox factor, since I believe that will be the greatest strength at the end of the day. Ultimately, this attempt at anime fantasy is a leaner and meaner spin than D Besom D20 ever was. If this converts more weebs to the table, then that's an absolute win in my eyes, and I'll happily lead the charge. Of course, if any of those weebs ask me to GM a campaign of SAO, then I'm going to happily throw them off the bus. Stay frosty!